Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures Daily Dose of Nature. Today's topic, the six P's of safari photography, presented by NatHab expedition leader, Richard de Gouvea. I'm your host, Rob Mess. Thank you all so much for joining us here today. Over to you, Richard. Thank you, Rob, and thanks everyone for tuning in. What a pleasure it is to be back with you guys on a Wednesday and talking about the thing that's almost closest to my heart besides my family, and that's photography. Very often my wife asks me who I love more, my camera or her. The obvious answer is the camera, but uh, it doesn't talk back to me. So here we are. We are going to talk today about the six P's or my six P's of photography. Now, I was taught by a guest about the seven P's, but I put this to parental guidance. So the six P's basically stand for proper prior planning prevents poor performance. There is another P in there, but uh, you can try and figure that one out as a little anagram for those who, who wish to play with it. And it really stands out for me as something that is a great indicator of what is to come because proper prior planning prevents poor performance. If you're not ready out there with wildlife, you are going to miss the moment or you're going to mess it up in some way. So being ready and being thoughtful is vitally important. And when I think of photography, I think of simplicity and concentrating on the art. And in order to do that, if I have all my other bits and pieces in place, I don't have to worry too much about settings. I don't have to worry too much about anything but what I'm trying to put out. So I'm not a setting centric type of photographer. I'm more a creative capture the moment type of photographer trying to tell the story that comes along with it. So as the one of those P's, my first P is planning and that is a vitally, vitally important part to this whole thing. And it is such an important part that I think for every trip, every one of you ever goes on, you need to consider what it is you're going to photograph and how you wish to capture it. And each time you go, you might do it in a different way. So even if you do the same trip twice, let's say you've got Yellowstone National Park not too far away from you and you like to do that once or twice a year. Each time you go, you can have a different perspective and a different plan as to what you're going to capture. So the first thing that comes out is what are we going to pack? So let's see if this, my computer's been playing fun with me. So this is me packing my bag for a typical safari. There's a lot of things that go into one little, little satchel and that goes in my carry-on. And obviously carry-on weight is limited. So I have to look very, very strong as I'm walking through because my camera gear weighs a, weighs a fair amount as we're going along. So first thing that always goes in is my baby, the 400 mil. Um, sometimes the 135 mil will come with me. 1635 is definitely in there. 70 to 200, definitely in there. And then I have two bodies. Very importantly, um, specifically for the fact that I don't want to be changing lenses. I want a variety to choose from as we're going along. So my two bodies, um, I will have a number of memory cards in case one fails, card readers, external hard drive to be able to put all my stuff on and make sure that I have enough space for all the images I take because I take lots of images, teleconverter in case things are further away depending on the trip, um, binoculars, lens strap, poncho, sanitizer because we're uh, still dealing with this thing called COVID which just doesn't seem to leave us, at least it's not having the impact it did, camera lens cloths, um, tripods, and obviously binoculars, very important for anything that's going on, on along our beautiful journey. Try to get out of here. So when I'm choosing this, I mean, this is a lot in one bag, but depending on the trip, 
I'm going to choose different gear. So like the 135 mil may not come with me to a regular safari unless I'm trying to do something a little different and trying to push myself. But regular safari in general is all about the cats. It's all about getting close up on things and getting the detail and the definition that we require in order to make beautiful, beautiful images and to tell the stories. And when it comes to wildlife, the first thing we look at getting is a long lens, something that can zoom in, that can really help us get the details out of these things and get the expressions. Something like this rhino, very difficult normally to capture an expression because an eye, the eye is so dark and small on the body. So being able to zoom in like this, having this oxpecker almost looking straight down his eyeball there and him spewing up and breathing out as he's irritated with everything definitely makes a difference in this whole uh, system. We're trying to get images that are going to show off and make our subjects look beautiful and in the right light and perfectly balanced. And then also with wildlife, it's not just about going close, it's also about showing the scene and putting the animals in situ that we can tell a story. So this is a hide in Mashatu, one of the destinations we used to go to on our South Africa travels. Um, and we're right at water level and being able to watch these families come about, the birds flying about, it's all about the stories and how we translate that. And so my go-to lens for a safari, basic safari, is to use my 400 mil as the primary body on my A1. So that gives me the reach and being a prime lens and a very fast f2.8 lens gives me incredible image quality, really, really strong at being able to do things. And then on the second body, I'll have the 70 to 200 because that gives me the ability to go a bit wider to make the images look a little bit more beautiful and show animals in situ in their environment rather than just a close-up of a face. Um, and that's what really defines things. And then I will keep a 1635 with me, um, a much wider angle lens for landscapes for Astro, and we'll talk about that now. The 135 I've used to great um, success in the gorillas being a very primary portrait lens, it allows me to get a very shallow depth of field and to create images that are really punchy and strong and very, very sharp. Um, if for say, we're going to a more birding destination like a Uganda or on a specific trip, maybe Madagascar doing birds only, then I'm looking at a different lens. So then I'm looking at a 600 mil or using that teleconverter to get me a little further. So I'm already starting to think before I've left, what, am, what, what are my goals for this trip? What am I trying to photograph? What am I trying to capture? And this then gives us a different perspective on everything and allows us to choose the correct things we're going to need. Um, and birds specifically, require much longer lenses or high megapixel cameras that we're able to then crop in and get a little closer and get the detail. Now, the modern technology is really stripped on and we're now sitting with cameras that are able to give us bird eye autofocus and be able to lock in on those eyes and really give us pinpoint stuff, especially with birds in flight and doing things like that. Like I said earlier too, Wide angles make a huge difference to everything. So being able to go wide and use a 16 to 35 to capture the scenes of these beautiful locations in these environments, because it's not just about the animals. We can see these animals in zoos. I can go to a zoo and get really close up with a long lens and get an eyeball shot if I want to. But showing an animal in its environment or showing the environment within which that you are can really create very different feelings and I'm really excited to get back to Madagascar this year and um, the trips are running again so that's really exciting this is from a, a place called Isalu and it's really beautiful with these sandstone rocks so having that wide angle lens means that I have this ability to get in there and even 
with longer lenses. So this was with 100, 400 Sony um, at a much wider thing. I was on a private trip with a NADHAP guest, just him and I on a photographic mission. And we set off in the Okavanga Delta and there'd been a massive fire. There was this smoke lingering around this very burnt, burnt foreground and a big kudu bull walking around through that with the sunrise. I loved the contrast of the blue and the orange and how that all sat together, the three trees next to one another, the one subject walking across. And being able to go wide, if I'd gone close in there, we would have lost that whole scene. The whole power of that image would have been lost to that forever. And then obviously being in wild areas, Astro, our, our light pollution is so low that it allows us to get these incredible images of the stars. And I love sitting out with the guests in the evenings after a sundowner or at the lodge where we can walk out. This was again in Isalu and Madagascar. Look at that Milky Way, such dark skies there. It's really, really spectacular. And even do some big panoramas and show the, show the Milky Way doing its thing. And it's all about that lens choice. How are we going to choose what lens we're going to take based on what we're going to see? So gorillas, I'm looking at a 70 to 200. I'm probably going to take 100, 400 with me rather than the 400 2.8 because of space and obviously not have packing guidelines. Um, you know, undies, underwear are, are optional when you start packing your camera gear because you need as much camera gear as possible and you can always wear your underwear inside out and you get two days out of those. So you just got to think about how that all rolls out. Um, so that packing is very different from what I would do on a normal safari where I have the bigger lens uh, with the 400 2.8. If I'm doing a birding safari, the 600 mil and obviously in the wild areas thinking about the night skies, but then something like Madagascar comes along and I'm going to pack completely differently again because I'm going to want to get closer to things. There's so much other rich detail in the small stuff, in the chameleons, in the insects, in how they all move around. So my 100-400 is my go-to lens on that trip because it gives me the distance to be able to get the lemurs. But at the same time, it has this incredible ability to do macro photography and to focus at less than three feet away from you. So you can have full extension at 400 mils and be right up on something and get some really amazing stuff. And macro lenses themselves work really well at getting that detail out of the smaller things and showing the beauty of nature and its intricacy. And even here, just the ant stuck in the little spider web here. Spider hadn't come out yet. The dew drops around. It just there's a, there's a very different feel to an image when you start doing macro. So I plan for macro when I go to Madagascar. I plan for dark situations when I'm in Uganda and Rwanda. I plan for close up and high speed photography in these areas. And I'm always looking for opportunities at landscape and stars. So planning is my first P. The next P is the definition of photography. Painting with light. Photo means light and graphy to draw or to paint. And when we understand this concept of painting with light, we start to understand how the camera thinks. And when we are thinking about it, the baseline understanding is that in a digital camera, the camera is trying to make sure the light balances out to 19% gray. If it doesn't find the 19% gray, it will darken certain areas and lighten others. So we're really trying to punch out different things. So here's a shot from a hot air balloon over Uganda, uh, over Namibia and the desert. We've got little oryx down here spread out across the desert floor. The sun's rays coming through the clouds. It was a spectacular morning. And ensuring that I had composed correctly with approximately a third base and two thirds sky, it gives this real feel. And then with some editing, we're able to pull those sun rays out and give that real punch to it. But light comes in different forms. And when it is 
like this and you have these darker areas specifically this image here of the egret where you have this very dark background on a white bird when i was talking about the 19 percent gray the camera is going to try and take that dark area and go that is very far from gray, gray buddy we need to lift the light in that i have to override that and I would do that by using a negative exposure compensation. So basically we're saying to the camera, listen, bud, you read the light, but I want you to let less light in. And in doing so, I can pop the egret against this very, very dark background, which makes it beautiful. It makes him the subject stand out. And in the mirrorless cameras nowadays, we're able to see this live while we're shooting. So we don't have to take a photo, look at it, readjust, take it again. As I look through the eyepiece, I can see how this is all coming together and move along from there. Even at night, where we've got spotlights on the animals, which don't harm them, we're not shining on them when they're hunting. Um, you can see her eyes are well open and you create these very different images. But if the camera was left to do its own thing, it would completely blow out that image. This leopard would be very white because it's trying to fix all this dark area that it sees around because it goes mm -mm, error error and and that's not the way we really want it to to go along even here with this leopard um more at a twilight hour where you can see that blue light in the background it's all about the balance of light and sometimes we can do it perfectly in camera sometimes we have to consider it and do it in post-production which we'll look at a bit later we also thinking about as we're painting with this light, how much light and how much time we're putting in. So when I'm shooting, I'm always shooting in a manual mode. Auto means the guy who created the camera or programmed the camera is in control, which I don't like. I prefer to be in control because that gives me the creative power. So most of the time when I'm shooting on a slower lens of 4.5 4 to 5.6, what I'm doing is I'm shooting in shutter priority. I want to make sure that I can get an image that is going to be absolutely pin sharp, like that hippo coming along there. Um, and in doing that and freezing the action, I can ensure that my subject is always sharp and in good condition. But I also have creative control to slow down that shutter speed and to ensure that, that things are moving so I can capture the movement. And here you have two lechwe running through the water. Um, the second one is almost ghosted out in the background. And you get the sense of movement, the water moving, everything going along, all based on the fact that we're trying to paint with the light in a different way, just recording extra time and following the animals. The other thing that comes into painting with light is aperture. And aperture is the size of the hole through which light comes in. By making that much bigger, we obviously allow more light in, which allows us more opportunity to freeze action and get these really crisp shots. But what it also does is it reduces depth of field, which then becomes the next creative point. Because what are we trying to show? Is the background important? Is there more than one animal that needs to come into that focus? So we have to come into that and even doing longer exposures like the stars where we have these beautiful stars, but you're having a 30 second exposure. This light in the foreground was all created by the lodge at which we were staying, um, which was Little Kulala. We walked out into the desert took these photos as the clouds were moving in and the light from the lodge flooded in and lit up the foreground, creating a great, great way to see things. Um, and that then led, leads us on to the personal side of the story. What story are we trying to tell? What is personal about that that somebody else might find interesting? Um, and even looking at these images here, this is a, a young gorilla here that has blonde hair. 
and it's believed that this gorilla and this mother is this mother is a bit old but also the group has had the silverback around for a long time and it's inbreeding that's created this problem and the babies keep dying it's the third one they've had in about two years now and it became a story what what are we trying to show that we need more space for these gorillas even though that this uh, their numbers are doing really well they need space in order to mix and get new genetic material into families and ensure that this doesn't happen because all that we're doing is fighting a long fight and going back to this gorilla about three months later the baby was still alive and it was part of that story was was the baby still alive would i get to see it again we went to that family and mom came walking by and that was the last time i saw the baby before before it passed away so stories are very very important this is a very fun photo that i love um of a whole bunch of quilia dancing in the in the light and i'd slowed the shutter speed down the sun was setting in the background and to put this in perspective, Quilia probably are the most abundant bird on the planet. At the height of breeding, there are around a trillion birds that move around and they move in super flocks. So you can have two million birds moving in the same flock. And when they're moving, they swarm and they, uh, they create those murmurations like you might have seen in starlings where they move like fish in a shoal. And what is amazing is this all ends up happening. And how do you capture that? The story for me is the chaos. I took loads of photos at different shutter speeds to test how they were looking. But I'm looking at a screen that's this big and I'm trying to figure out which one's going to work. I can't. I'm going to have to wait till it gets on a computer. So I shoot and I take loads of photos. Cling, 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 cling. And I think this one worked out at about a 25th of a second. So there was a lot of chaos. You can see the little water droplets flying off here. But this one bird just got isolated just slightly and was in focus. And it just made the image for me. And it became this really beautiful thing that I called flocking millions. You'll find the pun in that. East Africa is also a great destination and a beautiful place to see in terms of beauty and these very flat umbrella thorns. And using a panorama and creating the story against the beautiful orange sun, uh, sunset, it just starts us off and puts us in a different place. It allows us to see things differently and to tell stories as you wish them to be seen. Here's an image from a recent trip on the pro photo trip to Botswana. Um, on that trip, there are two different helicopter flips that you do without the doors on it's very exhilarating but it also offers a very different perspective on to what's going to happen and we'll look at perspective again just now because it is another one of my peas um but this situation the impala were rutting and like your deer in the states they start boys get a little hung up on their testosterone and get all excited and life is going well and they start chasing each other around. So this young male was being chased by this big guy. This guy was coming in because he also thought he'd get part of the fight. But we watched him run for ages. Because of the low light, the story was these extended shadows, which for me look like Bushman paintings. They, they resemble Bushman paintings to me. And it really captures something inside that I really love. So it's personal to to my feeling then we have our backlit lion again on a on a safari down in south africa and one of the reserves where we visit mala mala and we have these magnificent opportunities to be close to these animals when they're doing things and are absolutely relaxed with our presence and this guy was following up on the ladies and sniffing them and testing their urine and making checking if anyone was ready to mate and he did what was called a Fleming grimace and there was another vehicle and because we were able to move this around we dropped our light and got the silhouette shot of his head and i just love the spotlight it explains the night drive and all of the other bits that go along with that 
stories are about showing how animals are looking intensely. Ears are looking in the same direction or pointing in the same direction as where they're looking. Backlit, love backlit shots because a lot of people are told that the one place you shoot from is having the light behind you. And this is all back to that painting with light. But the personal story I'm trying to tell is her interest in what was going on and the time of day and how we tell that story. And still, probably one of the highlights of my guiding career was going to see these beautiful northern white rhinos, the last two of their species on the planet, two ladies. Long story, but um, they're effectively in an enclosure and they're trying to keep the genetics alive. They both can't have babies. She, this specific one, can't have babies because she walked on concrete too long, so she can't support the weight. And her daughter is barren, so she can't, she can't, the, the eggs won't fertilize or won't uh, implant in the uterus. So they're going to use white, uh, southern white rhinos to bring that up. But the idea of getting so close and being able to get hands on with a creature is not always my favorite thing. But in this case, it was my favorite thing. I was crying. I was allowed to get out with them. And we'll look at the perspectives I got from being out of a vehicle versus in the vehicle and how I placed that. But this is a personal story of just love and gratefulness. And then something a little different, a lioness shot at very slow shutter speeds to create more of a painting feel, something more artistic and more personal to me. Not everyone will like it. Do I care? No, it's mine. It's my art. I'll choose it. And there will be one other person at least that will feel the same feelings and emotions that I feel when I see that image. So making images personal is very, very important to this whole process called photography. And perspective. Perspective is amazingly important and it's my fourth P. Now, I will show you one image from a higher perspective, standing up, shooting the gorillas, and then the next image, getting down, shooting the exact same gorilla, just changing my level, getting right on the ground, having things in the foreground blurred, the background more blurred, and by dropping lower, we get a greater distance between subject and background. So I'm gonna go back to this one, you can see how close the background is here and it becomes a bit busy. But in this one, there's utter clarity just going through. And it's just beautiful to change that perspective. And it depends on which way you want to look at it. You can shoot down on something if you want it to look smaller. And I often do it in landscapes, animals in landscape. You want to shoot down on so you can show them in this great, magnificent, big, wide open space. Where other times it doesn't work the same. These lions, very similar story. So here we have three different lions or two, the same lion and one different one. But depending on how we shoot it, whether we go uber wide or go in a little bit tighter or really tight, changes the image and changes the way we see the image completely. Perspective can also be set at the point of what is in the background and how we place the animal. With a lot of the places we go, we're allowed to go off road. Or when we're with the gorillas, we're allowed to move around. Yes, you may have to ask the local guides so that you don't step on a baby gorilla because that would end your life pretty quickly. Um, but, you know, being conscious of what's in the background will also impact the animal. Um, so, even looking at these two images here, the first image, we had trees that were just to the right of this lioness in the background. So it made a little bit more of a busy background. But moving a little bit round, we were able to put these darker skies in the background and not have the clutter of other trees. So you're always looking at the height you're shooting from, what's in the scene, and how that all translates. Here we have a white rhino. I could have shot it very close up and taken a tight shot of that and it would have looked pretty but it would never have explained the magnitude of the rhino with the Waterberg mountain range in the background 
Now, this is one of the stops on the hidden South Africa trip in Maritaba. It's one of my favorite places because it's not often you see a big mountain range like this running through a reserve, and you can use that as a backdrop to really create different images and unique images that other people would not have taken or seen before. Having that perspective of how close animals get to you. Um, I don't think the guy on the back seat realized that he was in danger. Uh, he was still looking at the other lions, and this one was about to nibble on his buttocks. Um, but again, the animals are so relaxed in these areas, they love to move past the vehicles, and it's a great way to show them. Getting low. I wasn't out of the car here because I value my life and my, I would like to come back to my children afterwards. So by parking the vehicle or having us as your photo pro expedition leaders or your, your expedition leaders trying to put you in the best position, we will try and position the vehicle in a lower position so that you can get lower. Just that perspective changes everything. Shooting through foliage shows the depth of everything and the fact that you might have snuck into their world. It's all about perspective. And even here, a little bit of space around a steenbuck, overexposing it a little bit as the rising sun hits the inflorescence on the grass, the little animal being well exposed and trying to hide in amongst this. It really sets the tone for a minimalist but really powerful image. So always think about how you set things up and not just focusing straight in on the animal. Space is important and part of that perspective. We had a, a very interesting situation where we went up now also on this last trip. But as the pilot was taking the doors off of the airplane, two lions walked out and walked past the aircraft. And he duly had to jump in with us before we carried on. Um, and that flight was very productive because we had these perspectives, these really big open grassy areas that were dried up now. Big elephant bull staring up at us, his shadow going off. A lion hunting buffalo in the long grass just all makes for very, very pretty photography. Um, perspective is also set by what you put in it. So like I said, I, I had the privilege of being out of the vehicle with these guys and being able to shoot the guests with the animals. And by using a wider lens, going a bit lower and making sure that they were closer, it makes these guys look as big as what they are. They look much bigger than the vehicle just because of perspective. So how I put that in there. We change the perspective completely to showing that we can touch them by going close up but with a wide angle lens to really create this distortion out, make the horn look longer and changing the perspective in that way. Or getting right down low, close to the ground with these creatures and shooting up at the sky with this dark dramatic sky really creates some beautiful imagery in it and a very different perspective again to to create the image it's all about this creation image creation you'll notice i have given you very little settings because even in auto you can drive the camera to create other images by composition by looking at your perspective by looking at how you're going to paint with light and using that plus minus meter even something as simple as a cell phone has the ability to change light and to brighten areas or darken areas. So you're trying to work with that painting of light to do things. The fifth P is posing. And posing is a big part of photography because we're always looking for a unique angle on things. We're always looking to show people the best side of stuff and not always are they in that best place so we have to be preemptive and i think one of the greatest skills of a wildlife photographer is animal behavior the knowledge of animal behavior because if you understand what an animal is going to do next it can get you into planning your next shot putting yourself in the right position so this leopard here was up in a tree and she was waiting to come down 
we were waiting for her to come down and there was this this knot in the tree here where an old tree branch had been and the likelihood was that we were going to be in a, a space so we didn't photograph her in the tree because the space wasn't great we moved around and we checked the background to ensure that the background was good to get her coming down the tree and when she stopped at that point it was all guns blazing click 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 and then wait for it to come down the tree here i had a big elephant bull that was trying to show he was bigger than us there was a big storm in the background for me this is still one of my favorite photos i've ever taken because the storm seems to signify what's going on in his head if i look at the composition here and i did this all unbeknownst wasn't really thinking about it because it becomes second nature after a while is i have one third floor two thirds sky i have a rainstorm on this third and an elephant on this third. I have his head on the power spot. I have the storm on a power spot. The composition of that image just means you will go round in circles and keep looking at that detail and never feel like you need to leave the image. You can just sit and appreciate it, which I love. I love about that. Understanding that this gorilla was going to come and beat his chest was a big thing for me because this is one of those shots and I still have to get one head on it will come one day when I'm big and what the gorillas do is before they beat their chest and it was a cold day they often beat their chest to warm up is they'll and then they'll stand up and do it because they've got to inflate these air sacs on the chest and this then allows them to bring up that air so by knowing that he was going to do that i could get ready i could get the guests ready and we could move on from there the two leopards coming down again was all about positioning and waiting we could see mom was getting up to go and join the cubs as she was getting ready we moved into position with the sunset behind to be able to capture that and then the same thing as this was coming down and the light had dropped now we get the silhouette image i can't get the correct light to balance sun, sunset and, and leopard so now i'm dropping the exposure to get the silhouette as it's coming down painting with light being in the right place and posing the animals by knowing their behavior um the beautiful marine iguanas in galapagos this guy the sky everything space and they're looking in the sun not hard to get these guys because they're pretty much everywhere and they don't care about you you quite literally have to step over them because they just sit there and this was with a very wide angle lens which again creates a different feeling always look for animals looking up when posing especially if a bird's about to fly over or something because what ends up happening is those eyes light up and you get this beautiful reflection of the sky in the eyes and that glint in the eye is a very important and powerful thing that people even uh, cartoonists have used for years is creating the glint in the eye to show life and the eye is our point of focus where we're looking to focus most of the time unless we're trying to push the creative boundaries but as soon as they look up in anything it brings those eyes to life you could see how this cub was interested in a bird that was flying over there was a vulture coming over that was interested in the food and posing and getting silhouettes this beautiful tree mashatu again sunset and just going a little wider in order to set a scene rather than try and photograph her which we'd already done for an hour up until that point um big male lion that portrait photo of the hair the ears the eye contact the glint in the eye and if i can even go closer you can see a bit of the vehicle inside the eye so there's some real power to be had there and in a photo like this, I'm watching what my f-stop is because I don't want too much blur on the nose and the chin. Obviously, the eyes are going to be the point of focus, but we still want enough depth of field to get through the whole image. Being ready and knowing that when one hippo yawns, the likelihood is that another one will. And it's a threat display. And we'd actually set up some, some sundowners and one of them decided to show us what was going on. 
And then the next one did the same. We moved a little further away, but not without taking a photo of two while we were while we were doing that. Um, birds in flight. Certain birds have specific characteristics, like the bee eater loves to fly from stay on one perch and fly off and come back and then fly off and come back and catch a bee, uh, catch an insect and come back. So knowing that, we could prepare for the thing to come back each time. And you're then rapid firing and shooting off to make sure that you capture the best moment that you possibly can. So thinking a shot out, understanding behavior is vitally important. And if you don't fully understand it, having a guide with you who does will make your photography that much better because you can ask them what is going to happen next. I see the lion is sleeping here now, but what's going to happen next? That's your big thing you want to ask. And the last P, which doubles up as two Ps and could make the seven Ps, but we're not going to go there again, is post-production. And post-production is a big part of our, our work on photography. Um, I'm actually going to open these up on a different presentation just so that we can get a better resolution on this. So bear with me for a second. Six Ps. There we go. Um, let's go down to the bottom here. So post-production for me is such an important part of photography because it shows so much about an image and what's been happening. And for the longest time, people said that post-production was cheating. And I completely disagree because I work in a program called Lightroom. And when we were shooting on film, we worked in a program called The Dark Room, where we added chemicals. We could dodge and burn. We could lighten and darken. That's what dodge and burn is. And we could crop. We could work on specific areas. They could even add in things with some really hard skill. But post-production is vitally important to an image. So this was before. And a camera can only see as well as it can. It doesn't have the same dynamic range as our eye. So I believe that if we're doing post-production, we're trying to do it either to represent the scene that you saw or alternatively take it to such an extent that it becomes creative art, not a representative, not representative art. So this is before, that is after. Quite a big jump. Suddenly the clarity of the lion is up, the darker sky is there, and that is the way I remember the moment was a beautiful moment. Our eyes are incredible. Our cameras are incredible, but they do not have the ability of the human eye. We have this massive brain attached to us that is able to flip our image upside down for the first part and balance the light as they're going along. So post-production is vitally important. It also allows me to move the viewer where I want to because if we go back here, you can easily get be dragged into the area around the stomach here because it's a little brighter or to this line because he's facing you. But with the post-production and bringing that eye shine out and ensuring that this is balanced and the light across the whole line is balanced, that is your first point. You'll go back here and then come back to this line again and wonder what is it looking at. Here I had an elephant I was testing out the new A1 when they released it we'd gone to Maritava and this guy decided to give a head shake and make sure that we knew that he was the boss cool photo right there that's the way the camera caught it but there's a lot of dynamic range there's a lot of light that is not being capitalized on that we can utilize so by post-production we can change that image to really show the beauty of the clouds and that overcast day, all of this imagery, the dust on the sides starts to come out and he really begins to pop. We just bring those shadows out a bit and I'm constantly looking at my histogram when I'm shooting to make sure 
that my entire image is in balance so that when I'm doing post-production, I can do it with success and make sure that I can bring out the details the way my eye saw it. But there are moments where we go creative. Here we have a leopard in a tree. Not very appealing. But my aim on this was not to represent the exact situation because I knew it was impossible. The foreground was too dark and the background was too bright. And that balance would be thrown off because 19% gray doesn't matter what I do, the contrast is way too high. So I'm now going to push my camera and create something that's a little bit more creative. And that's what came out of it. And using sliders within Lightroom, I was able to change the coloration of the sky. By, by the camera's dynamic range, I was able to pull out all the detail from the foreground and the leopard and create an artistic piece that is not so much a representative art, but far more creative and punchy and different. And again, before, after very different images, very different way of looking at it. And that's where I'm going to leave off for now. Have you got any questions? Before we get into the question and answer session, I would like to remind everyone that you can submit your questions via the question field in your control panel. All right, let's get to some of these questions while we can. So do you have a specific kind of camera backpack that you use? Yeah, so this specific one that I use, and I've been searching around for a long, long time, is called the Peak Design Travel Backpack. These, they come in various sizes, and the insert in here is able to be changed. So this middle part over here, you can get bigger ones, smaller ones, depending on what you need. I've just got a big one that fits all of this stuff in. So. It just depends what your your need is. It works really well. It that one specifically fits beautifully into carry on. Nobody ever asks a question. Just if they ask you to weigh it, just make sure your foot's underneath it, just to perk it up a little bit, because it can beat that seven kilograms pretty quickly. <laughs> Great. Thanks for answering that. Uh, so, <clears throat> um, I'm sorry. So. Do you always shoot raw? Always. I have no need to shoot in JPEG. Um, JPEG is like packing for a NetHab trip. You are limited to a certain size, and that file size is defined. So NetHab tells you, this is the size of your bag. You can bring this. We suggest you bring X, Y, and Z, but you bring what you need to. And when you get to the airport, you then lock it and you might even cellophane it closed to make sure and that compresses the whole file. A raw file has way more, way, way, way more information. If we think about the yellows in this image, just this background image of these lion cubs, a JPEG file will have about 256 variances of yellow that it will be able to show. A raw file, depending on its bit rate, can be anything from 4,000 to 16,000 different shades of yellow within that. And that information is vitally important when I am pushing and pulling an image like that. So that is going to make a big difference to what I'm, what I'm putting out. So if I hadn't shot in raw here, I would never have been able to get the information out of this. And do you take a computer with you and download it to an external hard drive on Safari or you just use memory cards? Yeah, no, I, I take the computer with me because I want to be able to work on them while I'm there. Um, I'm also doing a lot of stuff with the guests. So being able to show it on a bigger screen makes, makes a lot of sense for me. Um, a lot of the new computers, the little MacBook Airs are tiny and light and so fast and easy to use that I see no reason why somebody shouldn't be taking it along. Even an iPad, 13-inch iPad, to view the images and clear them out is vitally important. But the biggest thing that I could recommend is a hard drive to store it on. You do not want to be deleting images off the back of your camera. And... I've seen guests do this. I've seen the fallout of them hitting 
delete all and pff, they're gone and there's tears. Now they've got to hope that they're able to get it back when they get home. That is not a nice feeling. So having extra space to back things up to ensure that you have it in the right space, this little, um, this little hard drive that I have here, I will find it quickly for that guy, little sand disk, it's tiny, and they go up to four terabytes. If you shoot four terabytes worth of video, I mean, photos on a trip, you're doing well, very well. So, yeah. Uh, do you have any opinion on what the best lightweight mirrorless camera for wildlife photography would be? I'm biased. Um, the Sonys are amazing, but it really depends on what you are trying to achieve with your photography, because I can sell you a system today that will cost you 25 grand pretty quickly. Or I can put the same system in your hand and it's a bridge camera, which you can handhold and it works better for some people than others who, which would work for wildlife or landscape. It has everything in it. So I think researching it correctly and um, understanding what your needs are rather than what your wants are, because it's not for everyone to be able to hold a 400 mil 2.8 and the camera, which then weighs an extra four and a half pounds that you're trying to hold steady while things are happening. So you've got to find that balance. So I would always go for full frame anything. The new Sonys are all amazing. The A7 IV, the A7 R5, the A1, all amazing high-end cameras. But something like the Sony RX10, which is a bridge camera, is amazing. An epic, epic camera to play with. Um, and I've had a lot of fun with it. And I probably think that they're going to bring a new one out sooner rather than later but i don't know that for sure do you use a dedicated macro lens for certain for certain things yes but it has to be pretty specific situations when i'm going out to find macro itself um macro is a beast unto its own and shouldn't be sniffed at really getting amazing macro shots is very difficult. I love the 100-400 Sony because of its versatility to be a long lens and a macro lens at the same time. And I save the insect photography and macro stuff more for around home when I'm bored here, where I have the time to be able to set up lights and all the rest of it to take proper images. Do you recommend carrying a tripod on safari? Yes, I do, especially if you're expecting to do night sky stuff. Um, but you'll need to be limited on the weight of it. There are a lot of great options. Again, I'm a bit of a peak design groupie, and they've made this most amazing tripod. It's expensive as all hell, but it'll be the only tripod that you buy, and it weighs just under two pounds, so it's it's really light and easy to pack. I often just put it in my packed luggage with my clothes. Nobody looks at it, it goes through, it meets me on the other side. So what skills should I have before signing up for a uh, photo pro trip versus a photo trip? That is a great question. I think it is not just about skill. I think it has to do with your willingness to learn. Taking a camera phone is just not gonna cut it as a photo pro type of trip. You're just not gonna learn enough about it. But anything from a bridge camera up and a propensity to really spend time. These trips are expensive. They go to the most amazing places. And when we get there, we are photo centric. So we sit, and if there's an opportunity that might happen in two hours, we don't rush off to try and tick off how many lines we see. We want to see lines doing these four little lines looking like that. And that's what it's about is this time, this immersion. The trips are often longer. So this was a 19-day itinerary, which allowed us to get to different places 
to spend time and to have multiple opportunities to get the best photographs. And then any of the photo, photo pro ELs, the expedition leaders, will then take you through your camera personally, will take you through your images personally and find time to grow some part of your photography. And that's where it really gets, it's far more photo centric than what just a normal photo itinerary would be, which may be a bit longer or we take more photos, but it's not so moi into the photography. So when you are shooting, how do you know which perspectives you want? Is it just experience? taking thousands and thousands and thousands of photographs. I also changed the changed the aspect when I need to. So again, the, the experience comes through making mistakes. So the more photographs you take, the more you learn what you don't like and what you do like, and you start focusing on what you do like. Mm -hmm. um, even this shot here, we tried from the other side, but I like the backlight. So we drove around, and we took photos from different areas. I gave the guests the opportunity to take photos from all those different spaces. When the animals were looking the other way into the light, we took that photo too. But it came down to positioning and us being lower so that the animals were at eye level, where on the other side of this mound, they were higher so that we lost that perspective. And we had to wait for this look because this look explains the story of four cubs sitting on a termite mound waiting for mom to come back to tell them if there's breakfast or not. And the moment any sound went in the distance, they perked up and looked all in the same direction. So it was all about that creation, that thought, that thought process. So you, you have to try and think about what it is it does, what it is the perspective does, and what are you trying what story are you trying to tell that will drive the perspective you're looking at great well thank you for answering all these questions unfortunately that's going to be the last one that we do have time for today so i'm going to throw it back to you for your closing comments thank you thank you thank you thank you everyone for tuning in it's been awesome and i hope you're all jazzed up and excited for a year of photography out in the bush i know i am First trip next week. Super excited to get into the gorillas. All right. Thank you, Richard, so much for taking the time to present for us today. And I would also like to thank everyone who tuned in today. If you're interested in information on how you can travel with NatHab, give us a call at the number on your screen, or you can send us an email at info at nathab.com. Our adventure specialists are happy to help you out. Join us tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links, on our website at nathab.com slash webinars. We did record today's presentation, and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I will conclude the webinar. Goodbye, everybody. We'll see you next time.